specifics that impact upon creative practice in tropical locations. And Darwinite Town School is a dry tropical location and Ted's was the local Darwinite for the project. It's always keen to specify, it's all about you know, green lushness all the time, so you look at the tropical savanna as well as um, as a wet season and the green that brings. And engaging in creative practice in a tropical city has its own challenges. And a number of those that we actually encountered straight away as a research project were Oh, with things like the definition of what exactly is creative industries, what are creative industries. For example, one thing that came up very quickly was landscape architecture was not traditionally counted as part of the general framing of creative industries in the global north. And you just go look around the location here and just look outside and realise how much of life is spent in outdoor spaces in tropical locales. To realise that tropical, uh, landscape architecture is important to the creative industries in tropical cities as interior design, conventional architecture is. There's also things like the emphasis on creating walkable and cycling friendly cities, which is a fantastic thing and something to encourage in all locations, but just it meets its practical issues in tropical locations, especially during the height of, for example, wet seasons. It's just not always practical to be cycling everywhere. So things like this, great against the traditional approaches to how you build a creative city. That so in out. our study, Moving into a space that Dr. Tyler and Shrine um, has indicated by a number of key thinkers already. Richard Florin is foremost amongst them. He is the person that many of you might have heard about in terms of creative cities development. Uh, Richard Florin is famous for his coining of the creative class, this concept of a group of people who are globally mobile and cities need to think about the amenities they provide to attract them in order to grow economically, to enjoy the kind of growth that's been spoken about this morning. Famously, he talked about this sort of very descriptive way in which you need to build a city to attract them. Things like cafe strips, openness and tolerance, diversity, cultural environment, but also getting down to things like mountain biking. He was personally obsessed with mountain biking, which for me uh, is just problematic in terms of it presumes a particular kind of cultural worker, um, often perhaps someone who's young. And I know in my own research, a lot of the key growth, especially in regional areas, can often be in the creative industries around people who are engaging in creative practice as part of a semi-retirement lifestyle. They may not be necessarily looking for mountain biking, but for bike paths that make a valuable contribution to a local creative economy. Another key figure is Charles Landry, who's a Western European-based um, uh, writer, and he's got a similar kind of framework that he says creative cities need. Similar themes, uh, diversity, accessibility, organisational capacity and leadership. And I just give you these two thinkers. They've been very influential, especially at the intersection of university scholarship and policy making with governments. But one of the problems with these kinds of approaches is both Richard and Charles are very much in demand by governments around the country. I know Charles Landry was invited into Adelaide to be our sector thinker in residence that advised the government on how Adelaide could become a creative city. Now, they get invitations to do this everywhere all the time, and there are only so many things we can recommend to cities in terms of how you become a creative city. So the PowerPoint presentation that Charles gave us at the Adelaide City Council, or City Town Hall, was very similar to a kind of presentation he could have rolled out anywhere. You know, you need this, and it just had a sameness about it. You'll become diverse, and you'll become unique if you do the same thing I'm telling every other city I'm talking to this week. <laughs> Ironically, in some of his work, he does actually have some beautiful observations about Adelaide that come up, you know, in the, in the sort of presented in the detail, but it's not the overall picture of what is decided. So a number of these creative cities um, projects that have unfurled around the world have been based on what's happened and been successful elsewhere. Now, one of the key ones was the Boston, uh, what's what we call the Boston Mower. Boston had a harbour front that was run down, it was deindustrialized. And they decided to turn this into a retail consumer and inner city apartment complex. And it worked beautifully for them. It worked so beautifully for them that Toronto did it. Uh, Singapore did it at Clark Quay on their river. Uh, this is London Docklands. This is the Melbourne Docklands. Spot the difference. <laughs> this is Geelong, which has actually brought in some local artists to add value. And it was actually the local arts input that made his a little bit more unique. Darwin also did it. Um, because of the theme of what you did to become a creative city. And it's so unique that, in fact, when I was looking at what's doing the stamps, uh, buying this one, the last set of stamps I actually bought was um, figuring on uh, featuring tourism locations around the country, and they all tend to be these kind of precincts. And they are valuable, and they are desirable, and people do like them. But in terms of growing your creative industries, they don't necessarily speak to the uniqueness of place and what's actually going on. So these kinds of one-size-fits-all approaches domination of a lot of the sort of policy agendas that have been circulating around creative cities are what we were seeking to actually think through and challenge in this particular project. <coughs> Waterfront redevelopment, as well everyone has one, so the uniqueness of that is no longer necessarily there. A lot of the focus has also been on branding, but 
another way that a lot of places were approaching this was to get an anchor tenant, the Guggenheim uh, Galleries was a classic example of this. First in Bilbao and then Boston uh, just set, a, set about specifically wanting to set up Guggenheim in places that had once again suffered from deindustrialization and or uh, shifts in the global economy. So when they released, when they said they're going to have one in the southern hemisphere, I know Geelong once again was a very strong contender trying to get one in ended up going to uh, South America, I believe. So there's not enough of those to go around. You know, Liverpool has the TAFE, Bilbao has the Guggenheim, there just aren't enough of those kinds of anchor tenants around. So when it came to Darwin, we weren't going to necessarily sort of, you know, recommend it to go and do a harbour front re redevelopment, they're already doing that. And one of the tragedies was that they initially set out to include a lot of artistic and cultural space within that, but eventually they realised that having late night concerts wouldn't exactly resonate well with the tenants and all the lovely new residential developments they were putting in there. Um, and even things like art projections on walls wouldn't necessarily work very well with that community. There was also issues about the fact that it was mostly a privatised space, so a lot of the um, retail outlets didn't necessarily want people sort of hanging around, which is often what you want to do if you're creating a creative milieu. So there's all sorts of problems there. So what we did was we wanted to actually find out the truth of what was going on in Darwin. And it was obvious that a lot was. And the strength really lies in what the people were doing and in what was already going on in that place. In the organic practices that had emerged around the creative industries and around arts and creative practice, how can we best capture them to present that back to government as the things that you need to grow and which work here and which are already here and which actually will be sustainable here because they're already organically emerged. And actually turns out that the suburbs uh, look to the inner city, but not too much. We can't resolve the mismatch, but I have our paper on this, and if you, you want to hear more detail, but some of those places in the suburbs were actually, uh, weren't relying on the inner city that much for their, for their creative work. There's actually this nice network just within the inner city, uh, within the suburbs itself. But it, at the end of the day, it's, it just shows that it's actually, actually quite complex when we try and understand and map the workplaces as a whole. So, Sue always gets a great kick out of this map. It kind of looks like some kind of invasion force coming out of Darwin. But um, this is just a way of trying to show uh, at a regional level all these connections that were happening beyond Darwin. Uh, when we did the project, we gave them a map of Darwin, but people were writing stuff all down the side going, well, what about this community I work with uh, down in Alice Springs, or how, how do I display that? So we just got people to write everything down on the edge, and then I just tied them all up and tried to show that in and it just shows that you know, the creative workers are uh, heavily networked in their local region and linking all those communities into the creative life of Darwin. And then again, the same thing happens at that kind of uh, international and national level, uh, strong links out from Darwin to New South Wales and to Queensland, um, and also across to Asia and Europe, less so to the Americas. But I might just pass back over to Sue there. One of the other um, lovely things about the maps and the final release of the report was that it gave people intel and a chance to engage directly with the researchers. They could actually look at their own like, location and see how it figured in the overall picture of creating Darwin. The, I'm going to go quickly through some of the outcomes. They're all contained in the report, which is available online at PDF uh, form. And in many ways, creative people living or people interested in creativity or living in a tropical city, some of this might be a little blurred to you uh, in terms of the reports. But that was actually the response in some ways we got to in Darwin. There's actually a good response to get because it means we actually captured the mood of the community and provided, once again, as I just said, that evidence base back to uh, government, which is exactly what we were seeking to do. Now, the, the project had uh, a number of industry partners. The formal uh, partners provided some cash, and the signage of the project were Northern Territory governments and chief ministers office. Darwin City Council, so a number of similar concerns that the owner of the council region had, especially in terms of inner city uh, retail precincts and the way in which uh, suburban shopping centres are pulling a lot of the key retail into those. And also Tourism NT, who are actually wonderful partners in terms of understanding the need to tell a complex story, a place of strength, but often in the, the lived experience of a place, how do you communicate that to people from outside and give a sense of that complexity? So it's a no-brainer that our research did find that, was, that the creative industry played a fantastic contribution to the Darwin economy. They were especially located and especially strong.
strong in terms of operators and SMEs, small to medium enterprises. There weren't very many key large employers outside of the ABC and Charles Darwin University, but all up, they represented a very significant portion of the, the overall economic sector in town. And it's already been indicated by the graphs, what people were actually looking for in Darwin is, is key strength. There are a lot of things to be taken for granted when we either move to a tropical location or we stay in a tropical location. The lifestyle, the fact that you could be close to nature, you could have an outdoor lifestyle, you could get away from your workplace. If you live in inner city Melbourne, inner city Sydney, it's not going to be hard to just get some time out. Um, that aspect of just you know, what, going for a walk on the beach at the end of a, a hard day or just to get some sort of mental space is something that's been really ignored in more recent creative industry thinking. It's looking at the heart of it, uh, arts and creative practice since the Romantic period and before that, but it's something that's been sort of pushed to the side in a lot of contemporary ideas about what is creativity and how do you nurture it. There's a real emphasis on you know, lots of people's density, uh, inner city clubs need to be inner city and have lots of people brushing up against one another and somehow they're going to, that, that will create a spark of creativity. And it does for some people, but not for all. And a part of that was also a desire for work-life balance. If you're trying to actually build the creative industries in your region, not everyone is a 22-year-old who really wants to go to Google to work and work there 24-7. Some people have children, some people have partners, some people like their partners and children and want to spend time with them. <laughs> Amazing! Um, and once again, because you know, the whole mountain bike kind of focus, it's not to scratch from anyone who is a mountain biker and isn't 22, but uh, there are, there's more to life than just the kind of pitch that's often produced by the young, mobile, globally able to sort of go anywhere at the drop of a hat kind of creative worker. And there's a lot more complexity what people are looking for in creative practice. People might be actually looking to remain fairly small into the quality of life that they want. They're not always looking for some romantic thing. There's a lot of uh, possibilities there for cities and regions outside of inner cities can actually capitalise upon in terms of picking out why people might want to move here or stay here to engage in creative practice. In Darwin, um, ever since you know, many of you might be familiar with the beauty news in particular, we're very strong on building up Darwin as Australia's Asian city, and certainly that was borne out in uh, the research at a very practical level. Singapore is less than three hours away, Sydney is four and a half by air. So it makes sense for people to actually be engaging a lot in Asia. Also, our near north neighbours, a lot of people are just, you know, because of just, you know, a boat ride away, we're doing work across uh, nation, where for them there was their near neighbours, but it was very complex in terms of funding because it became an international project to work with someone 30 minutes away, whereas it was a national project to work with someone in Adelaide a long way away. But this is actually a key part of the strength of and the attractiveness of Darwin for a lot of people who wish to work in those kind of networks. Darwin is a heavily multicultural city. Um, it has a lot of people coming in from all over the world. It's long had um, a strong presence of people from Asia, a strong uh, Chinese community, and of course it is um, a heavily indigenous city as well. And so it's deeply multicultural. It also has a population of around 100,000. So when you have an arts or cultural event in Darwin, <coughs> You tend to get a lot of people, and you get a mixture of people. It's not just you know people who like that kind of music going to that event. It becomes something everybody in town goes to. It actually leads to a lot more uh, flow between communities than it, you would necessarily get in the larger cities, perhaps, which are often known for their multiculturalism by virtue of being larger cities. But people can often find a niche that they want to go to culturally in terms of art and not mingle as much. SMEs and sole traders are important in Darwin, as I've mentioned, and one of the key avenues for building that capacity and uh, in fact the sort of incubator of that talent through the markets. Some of you may have been to the Mingle Beach markets in particular, but also Flats and other places around Darwin have their own markets. And while most of us may know the Mingle Beach markets for the food, the stores there offered an entry level retail point for a lot of creative producers who then ended up having stores in the main street of Darwin at the airport in, uh, and in Grant. It was a good entry level retail pathway for people one that can happen in a lot of smaller regional areas and in many ways it's, it's happening in the room at the moment. But it's happening in smaller places, it's much easier to get access to key decision makers and key stakeholders. Darwin, 100,000 people, chances are that the Chief Minister could well be having coffee in the same coffee shop as you. So the opportunity to actually make things happen faster without having to go through all the barriers that you need to go through in a larger city is there and it's one of the key attractive, attractors of places like Darwin. And there's just obvious strengths that are unique to the tropics, things like the space to develop unique um, creative industry strengths around 